Um, my name is Abhilasha. I am a principal engineer at Intel working on platform security. I've been with Intel for almost 14 years. Uh, I know it sounds a lot for some of you, but time flies when you're having so much fun. There's a lot of uh, security stuff uh, that we do from looking at the chips, looking at the hardware and up the stack, looking at the firmware, looking at uh, the software stack. And uh, we could, we're gonna help, you know, at least provide you an overview of what's out there. Let's make this interactive and it'll, it'll be good to get your thoughts. Michael, up here. Yeah, I think I'll go. Yeah. I'll go. Um, my name is Michael Zuthan. I've been at Intel for about three and a half, four years. Been working very closely with Abolash uh, pretty much that entire time. I'm on the different side of the house. I do uh, marketing and communications. So whatever, you know, all the good work that Abolash or Prem do, I, you know, try to spin it into something packageable, if you will, uh, and then communicate. So what does that mean? A lot of the time, uh, you know, a lot of the focus I have is creating sales material for the field um, so they can sell uh, and promote the, the technologies and capabilities we're creating. Also, there's uh, you know outbound marketing, blogs, um, press releases, internal communications, uh, stuff like that. So that's that's kind of where my head's at. And then I, I do, just so you know, I have a seven month old boy on my chest. And so if I do leave for a few minutes, I'm handing him off to his mother. That's very cute. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Yeah, yeah, I guess it's my turn. So I'm an offensive security researcher at Intel. Unlike Abhilash and uh, Michael, I, I just joined last year. Uh, I finished my PhD from Purdue uh, uh, last year and then joined Intel. Uh, it's my team at Intel. We work to find uh, new kind of attacks, vulnerabilities, and also we try to do uh, develop a uh, uh, defense mechanism. Uh, mostly my expertise is in developing compiler based defenses. So it's really good to meet you folks and get to know about you as well. Thank you, Priyam. Since it's a small group, uh, Heidi, do you want to have all the attendees also go through or do you want it? If they're comfortable, yeah. Uh, I can go next. Um, I'm Heidi Shanklin. Uh, hold on, let me admit somebody. Okay, uh, I'm a part of CSG. I also do, um, I teach some of the CodePath uh, cybersecurity classes. Um, or it's one class. I teach a cybersecurity uh, CodePath class um, for UT Dallas as well. Um, and I am currently a junior CS major. And then uh, I'm Leith Abbasad. I'm currently serving as president of CSG, I'm doing a CS degree, also a junior. Thank you. Nice to meet you. The CSG is Computer Security Group, is it? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, Anyone else want to jump in? Heidi and Arnold, you can do it too if you want. They're a few years in college. Okay. Hi, my name is Heidi, and I'm in sixth grade and like cybersecurity. Hello, it's nice to meet you or see you again or hear from you again, Heidi, whatever it is. Hi, my name is Arlene, 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 and I'm in third grade. Nice to meet you guys. That was on purpose. What? That was on purpose so that everybody pays attention in the talk. <laughs> That's good, Anna. Yeah. Okay, so how about this? You know, um, if you have questions in the talk, you get what you like, you know, it'll be very useful. So I can start sharing and I can go over some of the concepts. And what we can do is to figure out um like what are your interest areas? What what are your questions? And I'd be happy to answer. And uh, we can together find some opportunities if you want to take certain topics further on. Is that okay? Yeah, it sounds good. Okay. So let me know when you can see.
Is that uh, yep. can you see? It? Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, here is a concept um, called fearless computing, and that's what we're going to talk about today. And um, the idea really starts from the observation that there are millions of devices out there. There are billions of connected devices. And essentially what you have is the, there will be a lot more, right? The different form factors. I see most of you with your headsets on and I'm pretty sure it's more than one device around you, right? And we are living in a world where devices are basically an integral part of our lives and, they, and we're gonna see more and more connected devices. They're laptops, they are little, little devices, Alexas or even your refrigerator or um, your vehicle, any any device that um, you use for day to day has a certain amount of compute in it. With these devices um, come new threats. So you have new ways of using it. At some point there was, you know, you would use a key to open a car at this, and now it would be your phone or it'll be some other devices that would enable a use case that you never thought. Those new use cases are very good, but it also comes with new threats. So I just gave you an example of a key and a phone. Can you give me an example of some new type of use case that you hadn't seen even in your you know, few years that is new uh, from your perspective? Anything, maybe in your college or I'm trying I'm to think of the device. dumbest device I've seen. Which one? Trying to think of the dumbest device I've seen. Dumbest device. <laughs> I, I used to think all devices are rather dumb and we need to build some intelligence, but. Um, a fridge with touch screen. A fridge with a touch screen. What could happen if you uh, hacked into it? If you come, if you compromise that refrigerator, you come to know about whether that person is at home or not at home. So with those new, you know, relatively, you know, innocent looking information where you were looking at uh, your calendar or some pictures, but if you land up compromising it, you have new class of threats that emerge. You know, what if somebody hacks into your toaster or a refrigerator? Those things will lead to uh, different types of attacks. And that's what we're going to talk about is as uh, I think this is a delay in. So as computing becomes such an important part of our lives, whether you go to a restaurant when you start going or remote calls, uh, if you talk to a doctor nowadays, it, it would be over, you know, telehealth where you are able to um, talk about very sensitive information online. So you're not sitting in a closed room and very, you know, are having that one-to-one -one talk. You're having it online with a doctor that you can trust and make sure that your privacy is preserved. You're constantly in front of the screen as part of your education, your socializing. And you once you start looking at different records, you will see how it becomes if you really start counting, like uh, late people looking at what is my dumbest device, or it's hard to look at the, you can't think of devices as a separate thing. It's a very important day-to-day -day part of your life. Um, for each one of them, um, like in our world, uh, as Michael, Priyam, some of us uh, in our work life used to be like going to office and coming back. At this point, our lives have changed to working on personal, uh, you know, between kids' classrooms and also doing some online groceries to going back to work. And it, it goes back and forth through multiple gadgets in the house. And this is very important to note. You know, you're not inside a secured area and you're not outside a secured area. You are constantly going back and forth, juggling with a lot of different tasks which uh, for which you need to consider the different types of attacks that can happen and how that can spread across those multiple tasks. So for something that important, there is a lot of fear associated with uh, clicking on a link, being able to not get compromised because you downloaded an app which your friend talks so much about. So more than me describing it to you, let me make sure I have 
a little video that um, the, FFL, the kids when put you together. When you're researching a topic online, are you able to hear this? Question on yeah. Google, and right when you're about to click on a website, yes. you realize it might be a virus or a scam. Have you ever felt uh, an app you got has a virus on it? Have you ever felt that being secure is such a big problem? Have you ever felt like you need to give away your information to try a new app? Have you ever felt like you had no control over who uses your info? Have you ever felt guilty for trying something new and wonder if it might be bad? Would you like if you could click any button on the internet or download any app? What would it take to defeat the attackers? So, if I ask that question of you, what do you think, what would it take to defeat the attackers? What are some of the things that you know about? I'm sorry, I don't want to put you on spot, but any, you can even write down your comments if you want to, I can take an eye. Antivirus is a good one, Terry. Um, and what is SMA? Sorry, I was in the middle of typing. I was trying to say like something like uh, AI, or not say, AI, but like AI driven like honey nuts, or there's another name for it, but something like that. So that's a really interesting one, actually. So it allows you to put, um, and maybe Priyam, you know more about it also, like the uh, the ability to intelligently put some traps or something where you know if there's an attacker, he is um, the attacker is bound to uh, be detected if you are putting some traps across different areas, which is uh, based on AI. Is that is that what you mean, Heidi? Yeah. multi-factor authentication. So if you know who uh, who is really um, behind the screen, then you know that it is not an attacker. It is actually a real person that you actually know and trust. Good passwords is super important. Everything is the front door to um, our all our services, whether it is your social uh, account, to your bank, to anything else. Um, and um, ad blockers and some of the uh, uh, the basic things as uh, Afrida is mentioning is also extremely important because uh, we want to make sure that we provide security by design like we create an environment where you can move with some confidence you have the antivirus on you have the ad blockers you know how to strongly authenticate a user and you have an infrastructure that is keeping an eye out for you so today I'll give you a couple of quick examples of how we work towards providing security by design. So consider um, PC. Now you think of it as a black box, right? Like it's something that will take, if you have a device, within this device comes a lot of different types of uh, pieces. It's got, an, it's got the hardware, which has got the CPU, it has the, a trusted platform module, it's got memory, it's got storage, I.O. These are things you will be learning in college or if you, you know, as um, as you learn about computer architecture, you see what's under the hood. On top of that, you have an operating system. And on top of that, all these apps that you, you know, that, that you interact with on a day to day basis. So essentially what you have is the ability for the security the software foundation is in the hardware, you know, making sure that your hardware is not compromised and the data that is being used and the data that you're generating is encrypted. We also want to make sure that the, the compute itself is protected. So I'll elaborate a little bit more on that, which is if you consider so many different apps running on the same PC, if one app gets compromised, then the entire PC gets compromised. Yeah, because it just takes one thing to go wrong before you have everything else going down. Now, if we take it uh, to the next level and we were able to isolate, just like in a, um, with the COVID situation, what was the number one thing that was asked of people to not spread the virus? 
social distancing. Exactly. In a similar fashion, if you distance the apps from each other so that they are isolated and they cannot spread and infect each other, that's a very basic concept that we are using in, uh, in, our, in our compute as well. So one, the solution is that either you use two different PCs, but even if you love gadgets, you wouldn't want a single PC for a single app. But what we do is we provide that kind of social distancing based on virtualization. So virtualization-based security provides that level of isolation so that if one thing gets compromised, the other is still safe. And it strengthens the security based on that isolation. Any questions or uh, any, uh, is this easy to understand? Okay. That is the number one thing. The, and I'm happy to answer a lot of questions on this. I'm sure in your school, when you have labs or you're doing cybersecurity competitions, a lot of the time you're using uh, virtual machines and you're using that kind of infrastructure. But if you have any questions, happy to answer on that. The second important one is uh, privacy. And uh, I work with the kids, um, with Heidi Arnold and a very good group of kids here on looking at uh, how do you do some sleuthing? How do you find out more information? Because you can com combine a bunch of information and uh, get cues from interaction and be able to do social engineering and other types of attacks. So we want to be able to separate, you know, your private data from the data you want to actually publish. Because once you, you're, you know, you release a, some kind of data, it stays there on the internet for a very, very long time. So we want to make sure we are able to do that. And uh, one of the key things that we do uh, to preserve the privacy is making sure that we are able to uh, do things at your PC level. So not everything has to be connected to the internet. So if you're doing some fancy app where the hair color changes or you have you know different facial little, uh, those nice apps that allow you to do a bunch of fancy things, but the ability to use these AI apps and um, use the new, newest capability in 5G and some of the networking um, uh, technologies that are coming, you can actually do it locally on your PC. You can do things on your endpoint, which will preserve the privacy of your compute. And you can actually land up uh, doing, getting all the benefits without being scared or being worried that this information is going somewhere where you don't have much of control. So there's a, there's a lot of really good uh, advantage associated with distributed computing, which is where the world is going. There are also a lot of regulations. Uh, I know there's a California Consumer Act. We are all in different uh, states. So if you know of some other examples, feel free to add to the chat. But it, the privacy regulations are extremely good to know and understand because that drives how people set the technology. So if the if it is not allowed to have default passwords, then when you buy a brand new device, it will have a certain set of uh, capabilities that will comply with those regulations. And there are a lot of open questions. I mean, for those of you in UT Dallas looking at research problems, there are a lot of um, open problems which require additional research about whose data is it? Like now we are in a collaborative call and we have a few of us who are sharing the video, some of us are sharing the name, et cetera. And this data that is collected, that is being recorded, who is responsible for it? Who owns it? And how do you ensure there is a composition uh, where you are taking, understanding all the data flows from the data being created here, being stored in the cloud, being distributed with someone else? How do you track all this uh, flow of data and make sure it is still used correctly and it is protected? The third and final thing that I want to talk about in, in the context of fearless computing is the ease of use. So uh, uh, you gave examples like good passwords and making sure multi-factor authentication. In this, in this day and age, you're, all, you're not meeting in person as often and in all the services which are there is um, the, the prerequisite of getting any service is making sure that, that you can authenticate the user. So how do I know that this is Heidi or this is late or this is, um, uh, this is, uh, Vish, uh, this is 
Vishwa um, or Afrida, like just the folks in the, uh, on the bridge right now, the way you authenticate yourself is probably you have the um, username, password, or some way to authenticate. But as you are, as you very well know, somebody can have your username, password. So there's other ways of making sure it's you. They may add, ask you for an additional PIN. They may ask you for another device, something you have. They send you an SMS, or there are other ways of doing um, a one-time passcode. They can even check your fingerprint, your face, or it can also say, hey, are you calling in from Texas or are you calling in from Oregon and so on? So the ability to combine these multiple factors and uh, get strong and continuous authentication, which means it keeps checking. It doesn't just check when you're logging in. Those are some things which are very interesting and I encourage you to look into them as part of your research, as part of your education. Because the next, you know, in some years from now, people will, people will ask you that, how, um, you know, did you actually have to type in passwords to log into your service? It may become a thing of the past, but that's where we are headed, is we are, walk, uh, we are wanting good confidence uh, for our identity without having to do a lot of things. It happens behind the scenes with intelligent devices. And that's, pri that's primarily it. I just want to hit those three points and then open up for questions. We can talk about it. But what I really like in this, even if this is a small group, it's a diverse group. It's got uh, different types, you know, different ages, different, you know, places. And we come from different uh, lines of thinking. And I think that's really important. You know, the attacks come from all different places. The protectors, the defenders need to think in all different ways. That diversity and that inclusion for cybersecurity is fundamental. It's, it's very, very important that we keep on encouraging. And I've seen some really good work from UT Dallas. I've seen your initiatives to make sure that uh, those things are carried out. So we're happy to support more of such initiatives. And um, just in summary, I want to make sure that you're at a point where you're defining the future. And you don't have to live with what is already there. So building fearless computing, you know, it requires a lot of work uh, to build in security, build in privacy, make sure the usability is taken care of, and it's part of the platform design. It's also good, and I did this as part of my PhD too, is making sure that we support, we understand what are the policies. I used to work with standards uh, even then, and at the changes are driven with a lot of um, work with policies, laws, regulations. And the step number one is really the education and awareness, which is what I've seen, like what Heidi, you're driving as part of these talks, uh, the, the awareness and building a community where we are talking about it and then building that cyber talent. I think that's what's going to get us there. So I'm happy to take questions if you want to. Um, we also have, uh, if Priyam, Michael, if you want to add anything, please feel free to add. Yeah, so um, just kind of uh, from what you covered, what is, what is Intel doing um, as far as like hardware or software solutions for things like authentication and hypervisors? Yeah, so um, as, as I had made the stack where, where Intel has provided, provides the root of uh, trust in the system, like ultimately all software runs on the hardware. So providing the hardware that can support these software stacks. So whether it's a hypervisor, whether it's a, uh, having that fingerprint uh, solution work effectively or your display, your face is recognized. So it provides you the foundation on which the rest of it can be built. So there's a lot of work happening in each of those areas to provide you the hardware that the software can run on. Does that help, Nate? Yeah, I mean, that, that covers it. It's um, a good question. I was just curious about like your, uh, thoughts on like protection of biometric data or if they're what measures are good for that or like vulnerabilities with 
using biometric data to authenticate things? Yeah, um, so biometric is by definite, like just by nature of a biometric is probabilistic. So it's not like I asked you for a code and you said 731 and it's 731 and it's a perfect match. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, it will be like, okay, 732 will do or 730 would do. So it's probabilistic. If it's close by, it's okay, which basically gives us a room of error, right? It's a match. No two times when your photograph is taken is exactly the same. So the ability to check for liveness is one thing. You know, when biometric authentication, they will check, hey, is this Heidi's picture from right now or is it pre-recorded and somebody is just replaying it? Is it... Um, and there's a very nice paper by Rata, like I, if I can send it if uh, as needed, but it talks about different places where you can attack um, a biometric system. So I can either, in a fingerprint, I'd, if you've seen some of those movies, they pick up a fingerprint from a glass and they try to use it, um, it some of those. But those won't work in today's sensors because our sensors are actually looking for a 3D thing with thermal scans and it's looking... It's looking even for the the pulse. It's looking it's looking for um, any kind of liveness checks, making sure it's a live finger. Same thing for the face. It'll look for your eyes going here and there. It'll look for uh, you know clues and a three D sensing uh, that it is indeed a person with actual skin behind that image. Um, so so there is a lot of good uh, good ways of checking for liveness. There are also a lot of improvements in recognition algorithms to increase the accuracy, so less false positives, and um, also improving the experience. You know, like you, uh, if, if you go many years back, people never liked fingerprint sensors because you kept swiping, kept swiping, and it never used to work. Today, you expect it to work. You just use a device you touch and you expect it to work. So we've come some long ways, but it also comes with making sure nobody is able to spoof it. So that balance, that balancing act has been happening. So it's all three, by the way. So it's to your question, Heidi, mm -hmm. it's making sure with liveness comes the security. There's a lot of work happening to protect the privacy of this biometric. So if you use your biometric on your device, I can't steal your device and retrieve your biometric. So the privacy is protected as well as the usability, just so that we don't keep asking you, like, turn right, turn left, you know, I want you to get your face, it'll just recognize you. So all three things are handled quite well in those things. Hey, Abhash, I have a question for you. Um, so with all the new developments that we have, Intel has, and maybe other our partners have uh, with cybersecurity, you know, from starting at the hardware going up, you know, if if I was a kid, you know, there's college students here. Um, what would you say? What are the key technologies, capabilities should that, that you know kids in college right now or even younger should you know research, learn, and be able to use in the near future? If that makes sense, like what's coming out now that, that you know people should keep an eye on. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And thank you for bringing that up, Michael. And Priyam, I'm going to ask you to add to it in a second. Um, one of the main thing here is um, like, and this, this is where I learned from my kids a lot, is the ability to ask for virtual machines to be faster. Like these isolated VMs, if you ask people who've been there, um, they won't, they will say, hey, I'm a, you know, I'm a Linux person, I'm a Windows person forget about the operating system demand more, you know, like you, you can run anything anywhere and you don't have to be a person of a certain operating system. You can actually run anything you can. Uh, and these virtual machines, these, um, the new compute models allows you to do that. The second thing I would say, demand more privacy, you know, the ability don't give up on it. I think the idea of everything is already known to everybody. So why should I bother? I think you have your life in front of you where, there are so many implications to someone potentially mis misusing or just knowing too much about you. So advancing the privacy bar, you know, and I, there are ways of doing it if you just drive hard and see how to make that happen. Uh, so this is something I feel really passionate about. 
and maybe Priyam from advanced threats or from your research, if you can please add. Yeah, right. yeah, definitely too. So the first thing is definitely to understand what's, what's there today uh, before looking into the future to understand the technology first. And for future, uh, the newer form of attacks would be more automated uh, because uh, more distributed. Uh, you, the attacker uh, does, will not require a good machine or GPU to actually uh, mine the coins or perform any uh, uh, high tech uh, attack. Uh, it can distribute the uh, distribute the uh, attacks in a way that maybe your system uh, is a victim. Or you are a victim, and if you don't even know, so. Uh, those kind of attacks that is like very uh, stealthy, uh, that's like consuming your power. Uh, it's not even going for your password, your credential. It's just using your power, your memory, draining your system resources. So those kind of attacks will be like distributed attacks will be uh, uh, more and more common where uh, people will take advantages of uh, more AI and machine learning and uh, with all sorts of connected uh, uh, devices. So yeah, like. Uh, so look out for like maybe understanding how this kind of attack works uh, for uh, today would be better uh, for whoever is interested in uh, security or, or just in technology. So to a follow up question. So mm -hmm. something that's coming to mind is like homomorphic encryption. Would mm -hmm. that play here? So like you know, homomorphic. Yeah, like I will go, uh, I'll let you can uh, tell better, but it's a, a homomorphic encryption works uh, where we don't trust the system. Uh, for example, I'm, I'm driving an autonomous car and uh, I'm driving right now and I have to calculate what's the distance from me uh, for, uh, uh, from my next car or towards the signal. So, but I don't trust the cloud, which is going to perform my uh, 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 which is going to perform my uh, calculation. So then homomorphic encryption plays the role where we don't trust the cloud or the server where we are doing the uh, uh, operation. So that helps in some sense where uh, we don't trust uh, our system, but we can get the uh, calculation out of it. But it's it's one piece of the puzzle, like to have a complete security, we need uh, like a homomorphic encryption doesn't necessarily will help us when I'm browsing a, a website, but, but that there is a script within that website that is actually uh, taking advantages of my system, like uh, using my RAM. So it, it, homomorphic encryption will help us in some sort of way, but it will not cover uh, like the whole, uh, whole uh, thread landscape. Yeah. yeah. Excellent points there, right? And it's never one thing. It's always a bag of, like, uh, you can think of it like, the holistic solution of you know everything is there but it does though as Priyam right rightly said like it's not it's not going to be a standalone silver bullet and now everything is solved it will be a part of it but it also it's a very important thing you know as uh, Priyam was explaining if you don't trust somebody to do the work but you give them in an encrypted form and it can still compute like math is everything right like the ability to do the math being able to uh, I mean, I totally love crypto. So if there are anybody who's a crypto fan, you can um, talk more. But I think the idea is there is so much you can do without getting all the data in clear. You know, you don't have to ask for, hey, if I give me all the data, then I'm going to make some sense of it. You can mask it in so many different ways. And uh, homomorphic encryption is one way. So is the idea with that to basically mask the data in every way that it doesn't need to be used? Like, Yeah, like so you can you... get what you want to get from it. So if I want to say I have every, a bunch of COVID patients and I want to come to know, hey, what about them is causing them to fall sick and I want to know the age, I want to know how much they weigh, et cetera, right? So I can do those computations in the encrypted fashion without necessarily asking it, all that information in clear. I can deduce information without uh, necessarily you know having this is give, you know it's one and one or zero like you give me the data or you get no benefit so so how would that differ from having uh just not sending as much data to like a server or something so you um you're sending it in a sort of a sealed fashion you're not sending the data and clear you are sending some data but you're not sending in a way 
that it could be potentially misused. So for example, if I ask you for your home address to send you uh, some, you know, some gadget or something like that, that intention is good, but I could then use that same information for n number of wrong purposes, right? Because you didn't like that information is valuable or can be potentially misused in n number of ways. But as uh, Priyam was mentioning, like if you have a, a data which can, which you don't trust me for, you know, you don't, you should not trust me for doing, uh, taking care of your data, but you send me enough, you send me a token. It says, hey, if you, if you send your, um, you know, your equipment to this token address, it will reach me, right? But then I cannot take that token and do a bunch of other things because it was already in a mask fashion. And maybe Priyam, you can explain because further on, um, on that. Yeah, it's more like, for example, I want to calculate A plus B, but I don't have the resource, I don't have the calculator to do right now. So I send you something like, uh, uh, suppose function of A, function of B, and then uh, you will calculate function of A plus B and it will return me. So you don't necessarily know what is A, what is B, but you can perform uh, on some calculation on function of a and function of b and then when you return me the result which is function of a plus b then i kind of decrypt it and get my uh, uh, in, uh information out of it. okay so it, in that case are do the encryption schemes need to be developed knowing what the algorithm is so there's a like are they that. are they specific to one task is like each encryption scheme different so uh, yeah, like uh, so, different encryption uh, schemes has like different uh, level of uh, pros and cons. So uh, homomorphic encryption or this kind of encryption works better when uh, uh, when uh, we don't trust the system uh, itself. Uh, so and there are other encryption uh, mechanism like uh, uh, elliptic uh, cryptographic uh, ECC or Elgamal. So that also used for uh, having a secure communication channel as well. But uh, homomorphic encryption is more newer uh, form of encryption uh, where uh, it gives us a lot of flexibility uh, in terms of privacy, in, form of, uh, in terms of confidentiality of information. Yeah, there are companies okay. out there now, actually, earlier it was a bit uh, theoretical because uh, it wasn't very, because the performance was not so great, you know? But uh, if you look for a lot of, um, there are lots of papers on what are some optimized homomorphic encryption solutions out there. Uh, I think that may help you sort of, you know, um, you will get a good number of papers have been written on this. And uh, some of the, uh, the primitives that are being used may be similar, but sometimes they fine tune it to optimize further, uh, like that function that uh, Priyam mentioned is the key, you know, is how to make sure we find the right uh, uh, ri right optimized function, whether it's in elliptic curves or other things that allows you to do the computation in a short, in, in a more optimized fashion. And I did share an article um, from Intel Developer Zone, authored by our good friend, Jim Gordon. <laughs> All right, yeah, I'll look more yeah. into that. Yeah, it's it's very high level that arg um, article, but there's I think there's a lot of additional information out there. Okay, it's really interesting, and amongst them yeah. there are other things too. Like we talked about um, the anonymous credentials, the like the identity piece. Like um, if you were to go to a place and wanted to prove something, saying, "Hey, I'm more than twenty one," or "I'm." You know, I'm part of UT Dallas. Give me, you can issue me a library book. You don't have to give every information about you. You can selectively give that information so that um, you still check it's the right person, but you don't have to divulge everything about you to before you get a service. So there's some really interesting work out there. Other questions? Uh, I don't know how much like you'll be able to answer this. I, I saw that Intel's also like doing quantum computing stuff. Uh, I was curious, um, like if, if uh, there's any like measures of trying to figure out like solutions on how to 
protect like both from quantum and like regular computers on stuff like you know like uh anything that requires like large um factorization or stuff like that yeah uh so I, that that's really good are you taking a course or something on quantum cryptography um no i'm just that is something i'm just curious about <laughs> yeah it's very very interesting in fact uh there's a lot more um you know making sure uh you know how quantum cryptography uh basically um a lot of the crypto that we use today um is about what you mentioned is the difficulty of the discrete log problem and the difficulty of actually factoring those numbers associated with it. But um, the what happens with quantum cryptography, and I, I have to go back and uh, review some of the um, some of the you know mechanisms of how it breaks the you know it, it can release the factors, but it essentially the traditional RSA and the traditional um, asymmetric uh, crypto algorithms that depend on the discrete log problems um, get um, get compromised because you can easily factor the numbers so then you can decrypt and you can get the private key and you can basically decipher uh, encoded text but with um, quantum safe crypto the idea is that even if you had the ability to uh, solve those so there's some computationally hard problems so you know that's what crypto is based on is like something which is really hard for someone to do, even if they saw the ciphertext, right? They, they can't detect it. And uh, the reason why it's hard to do is because they can't factor those numbers. But if quantum crypto goes along and factors those numbers, then we can decrypt the text pretty easily. So um, what is happening is that there's a lot of work, Intel and the other key leaders in the industry are working together to, um, to define quantum safe crypto or either increasing the length of what is symmetric keys, you know, they increase the length to so make it really hard. But for asymmetric algorithms, there's a lot of work to define uh, newer ways of doing it so that once the quantum, um, you know, like if there were quantum computers uh, factoring those numbers, it doesn't necessarily, you know, compromise the secrets. It's very, uh, it's an, it's a very important. I would encourage you to keep looking more, look at where, how it's evolving, and see how it works. I uh, there are different aspects of it, and it's a very, very active. It'll change. Can you imagine what happens if none of the crypto actually works and uh, what it means, you know, uh, for previously secured data, for future data, and so on. Um, just another thing, like to. If if I wanted to like learn more about that, is there any like specific uh, classes or like types of things that I should go into more? Or, um, uh, Priyam, you may have the latest on the classes. My only thing from the crypto side is that there's a lot of work. There's a mathematical mm -hmm. evaluation of it. There's a physics angle to it. Yeah. You know, so there are, <laughs> yeah, I like that. Cap. So there's a, there's a, there are different ways of looking into it. I, I really enjoyed the physics aspect of what does it mean? You know, how does a quantum computer, how would it work? It was just a very simple one. You know, it, it was just a few bits. But I think um, getting heavier into it, I think there's a physics angle, there's a math angle. Maybe Priyam, uh, you may have pointers to classes that are more relevant today. Um, and we can look for those. Yeah, sure, so. Uh, so yeah, like as I should say, like uh, uh, yeah, you can go for like what you're interested in. Is it quantum computing? Is it like the quantum crypto? That means, uh, and then with quantum crypto, there are different uh, like is it quantum safe uh, cryptographic algorithms or it is more like uh, breaking it? So uh, there are uh, courses in Coursera that uh, I can recall on top of my hand, but yeah, like that yeah, that can be a good start, and there are like tons of new researches like uh, articles coming uh, 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 every day on quantum crypto but yeah like it's not there yet but it's good to always know uh, but as Abhilasha said like I'll just add one more thing uh, what Abhilasha said previously like right now what we guess like uh, breaking an algorithm cryptographic algorithm might take 10 years for that to occur and that's why we think it's safe and since quantum will make it easier to break it, like 
uh, maybe within like five minutes or six minutes, we will think it's unsafe. But as we know, for any uh, cryptographic mechanism, there are keys like uh, uh, that we use uh, for encryption or decryption. Uh, uh, right now, it's the key length is at most like 1024 bit to 56 bit. We can also increase it to like 5000 bit. That might uh, require more storage, more uh, computation, but there are ways that uh, we can still use the traditional crypto uh, with the newer form of technology. But coming back to your original question, like uh, I, I just went through the Coursera cryptography. Like there are not a lot of courses. Even I, I didn't find anything in, uh, uh, in even in Purdue. Like there were not a lot of graduate courses on quantum crypto. People are still uh, uh, focusing on more on improving the traditional crypto approaches. Mm, so yeah, like. Go for uh, Coursera uh, 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 online courses, and then there is also one in edX, I guess. Uh, uh, yeah, that's edX on quantum cryptography. So that can be a good start, and then you can find new articles. Also, like uh, aside from that, because that's still like a very huge thing and like a future thing as well. But is there any like certain crypto uh, algorithms or things? Uh, that you think are most important to focus on like currently so yeah like uh, uh as michael said like homomorphic encryption it's still like it's uh uh it's still in the i uh, say like in, in the improving phase it's still not fully evolved yet and it, it's very important because as we are good, getting more and more cloud focused and we are doing more and more calculations uh, cl uh in uh, clouds and servers so homomorphic encryption is is going to be one of the uh, uh like very widely used uh, encryption or crypto uh, in near future and and it all depends on uh, like what uh, what what kind of technology will we will be using in future so there will be more autonomous cars there will be uh, like your there will be more smart homes which will be connected to internet uh, your coffee machine like your friends can uh, like uh, control your coffee machine make coffee for you uh, uh, I can, uh, one example that uh, one of my friends have uh, uh, smart lights in his home and we all the friends can control the lights in his home. So those kind of things. So we have to look out for what the, what kind of technology the, uh, the future is going to give us and uh, what are the challenges uh, with those technologies we will face. And uh, are, these, are, are these traditional uh, uh, like defense mechanisms or cryptos are enough or not and what can we do better to improve uh, what we have today and what kind of technology like uh, crypto we uh, require in future so yeah like homomorphic encryption is a good start but there will be newer cryptos again yeah one thing i would like to add i mean exactly the interesting ones are the ones that priya mentioned but also looking at the basics making sure that we are looking at what we have today because there's so much legacy. So today, if you go to capture the flag and all, you'll, you, you'll see things like MD5 and SHA-1. These are deprecated crypto and they can be broken for a reason. So uh, understanding why are those hash algorithms or those encryption algorithms broken, being able to better understand the crypt analysis of it. Like, it's just not, don't take anything for granted. Like understanding what is there today Today, if you also looked uh, Wireshark or something, like see the way the communication is happening, you know, TLS 1.2, 1.1, like they are very basic protocols that you may have seen in classes, but they are applied. And the well-known broken things are also used widely, unfortunately, you know, and um, making sure while we go to the advanced uh, crypto and advanced concepts, we don't forget about the legacy and what is prevalent out there so that you know where you stand with respect to the security profile. I think this was a very good, uh, a good discussion, Heidi. I appreciate, you know, the, the questions and the Q&A. So thank you for putting this together. Yeah, thank you for uh, coming. I really appreciate that all of you could be here. Um, yeah. You know, I'll just end, um, you know, it's, it's awesome. 
that you all are interested in cybersecurity. You know, cybersecurity pretty much has a negative unemployment rate. Um, you know, pay is above average. Uh, you're actually making meaningful change in the world. So those are really three cool things about cybersecurity. Uh, though the downside is it's not easy, right? So you got to just stay with it. Um, but you know, it's awesome. It's fun. It's always it's a challenge. So if you like challenges, you know, even on the marketing and communication side, I have endless amount of challenges I have, uh, and we have on this side of the business. But uh, it's great. It's fun. It keeps me on my toes. And you know, we're working with cool people like Alpha Asha and Priam. Yeah, so, excellent points there, Michael. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That that's the main point, actually. <laughs> yeah. And so and feel free to like connect with us on LinkedIn or Twitter or Facebook or wherever. I'm not on Facebook very much anymore, but Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, you know, always happy to connect. I see your finger. Wait, Twitter? Like, what is Twitter? Um <laughs> Yeah, I don't I don't know what college kids do anymore is it is it instagram it's discord these days discord. Discord? <laughs> you know <laughs> i <laughs> i'm watching heidi try to get me on uh, discord once and i still couldn't figure it out but maybe i'm too this old great we do almost all like all of our csg stuff we do on discord um That's cool. yeah because it's just like a free what is this person say um, oh, uh, I, I would like I would disagree with what Afrita say, like uh, regarding professional, because I know like um, all the security communities, like all the uh, security professors, they actually connect via Twitter. They are pretty very active. Like academic people, uh, they are not like uh, the faculties. They are not very active in LinkedIn, so they take Twitter uh, as their way of communication, uh, and they are not. Yeah. Yeah, faculties are not on Discord as well. So, yeah, I would definitely say Twitter is is, is a very professional uh, platform for uh, the business side. And cybersecurity, it's nuts how many people are on Twitter on from cybersecurity specter spectrum spectrum whatever yeah. side things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And Michael's point is very important though. Like it's all about having that good communication. Even if you go to Black Hat, it's one of the most important things. It's like the lack of communication and being able to have that discussion is super. Is one of the most important things. Yeah. Yeah, not to uh, call you out, Afreda. Is that Afreda? Oh yeah, no, you're right. I'm just like really surprised. I've never heard of this before. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, it's big. Uh, Intel spends a lot of money on Twitter. And social media. <laughs> yeah, but okay, okay, this is great. This is good. Yeah, it's good to have a mind of your own and see where what your thoughts are. You know, those fresh comments, fresh eyes. Always, it's very good to you know, you know, understand, question it, see what's working going mm -hmm. forward. So. 